So I've already talked about other bacterial features uh, in the previous video. What I really wanted to do is spend some time talking about the bacterial cell wall. And the reason for this is that I'd say about a third of the antibiotics, maybe more, that we have target uh, the cell wall. And so it's important for us to understand how those antibiotics work. So you can take most clinically relevant bacteria and divide them up into two groups, gram-positive and gram-negative. And again, that depends on how they stain when we use gram-staining procedure. Now, the reason why this is important is because we'll see that there are some antibiotics that will target uh, gram-negative bacteria exclusively, and then there are others that will target only gram-positive bacteria. So once we understand how this works, then we can really um, understand those antibiotics better and it's easier to remember them as well. So that all depends, the, the staining uh, depends on the actual composition of the bacteria in terms of its cell wall and its lipid membrane and together that makes up the envelope structure. So here's a little schematic showing the cell wall in context of the cell membrane. So this is the cell wall and this is the cell membrane. Now cell membrane of course is a lipid uh, bilayer uh, just like any other cell. The cell wall is made up of glycan chains. Okay so that's glycan chains and these glycan chains are essentially repeating two units. So there's NAG and NAM abbreviations that we'll cover later on, but these repeat themselves. So these layers are then cross-linked by peptide cross-links. If we don't cross-link them, then they basically slide against each other and that cell wall would lack integrity that you need. So that cross-linking is critical because we'll talk about beta-lactams, including penicillin, that all target the cross-linking process. Now the cell wall is important for the bacteria obviously because it's a unicellular organism and it needs to be protected against changes in osmotic pressure. It also gives bacteria the shape. So we'll talk, about, we, we briefly uh, refer to shapes as rod-shaped and cocci and all that is determined by the cell wall components within the bacteria and more specifically by the enzymes that are present there. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of drugs. We have, I'd say, about a third of the drugs, if not more, uh, target the cell wall in one way or the other. So how do gram positives and gram negative uh, differ from each other when it comes to the cell wall? Well, the difference is that uh, the gram positives have a thicker cell wall. Okay, so gram positive have thicker cell wall. And it's about 50 times thicker than gram negative cell wall. But that doesn't mean that the gram negative bacteria are compromised in any way because they compensate for that thinner cell wall by having an extra lipid layer outside of the cell wall. And this lipid layer is specialized. It's made up of lipopolysaccharides, which we recognize as an endotoxin. And previously I mentioned how that is a virulence factor. In fact, that is responsible often for fever. So it's also pyrogenic. And it's recognized uh, by our innate immune system. So yes, they have a thinner cell wall, but they have that extra barrier to protect themselves. So we often say that the gram-negative bacteria have their cell wall within the periplasmic space because that space is between the two lipid layers and that's where the cell wall is. Now, if it, that's the periplasmic space, then any nutrient, any drug that needs to go in, so any nutrient or drug that needs to go inside the bacteria because this is the cytoplasm right here. It needs to make its way through the first layer and accumulate in the periplasmic space 
and then be imported from the periplasmic space into the cell. So that is quite a bit of barrier uh, when it comes to the outer lipid layer because once you go inside the periplasmic space, then the situation is the same as the gram-positive bacteria. So how would a bacteria able to import nutrients? Well, bacteria have specific importers or channels uh, that are known as porins. And these porin structures will allow polar molecules to go through and accumulate into the periplasmic space. Once it's inside the periplasmic space, obviously then there are other specific transporters that will take in those nutrients or whatever chemicals uh, that are coming through. Now we don't have to worry too much about molecules that are very lipophilic because they don't need to go through the polar um, channels. They often go right through the lipid layer, the LPS layer. Um, but the extent to which it can accumulate within the periplasmic space will of course depend on what that molecule is exactly. Now even though there are these polar, um, the, excuse me, porin channels, it doesn't mean that they allow things of unlimited size. In fact, there's an exclusion limit. So 700 Dalton is typical, typically the limit. Uh, anything bigger than that might have a difficult time going through it. So keep that in mind because sometimes what happens is that the molecules or drug molecules are simply too big uh, to go through that. Uh, the other criteria is that we're, uh, these polar, excuse me, these porins are designed to allow por polar molecules to go through. So if we talk about um, an antibiotic such as gentamicin, what we notice is that it's very polar. Right, so you got a lot of oxygens and amine groups, so it's very polar. Now it's polar enough to go through the porin structures. Then we have to look at the size. What's the size? Well, it has the size of 478, and I mentioned that the exclusion limit is 700, so it's still within the limit. So will it enter gram-negative bacteria? Yes, of course. And in fact, later we'll uh, talk about how gentamicin and other aminoglycosides have a spectrum of coverage that's almost uh, exclusively um, defined as gram-negative coverage. What about vancomycin? Well, now we're dealing with a large molecule. It's a huge molecule, 1400 uh, Dalton, which is about two times the limit, the size limit that we just talked about. It's polar, but it doesn't matter because it's too big to go through the porin, so it's too big for porins. So would vancomycin go uh, inside? No, of course it wouldn't. So that's why vancomycin is not useful for treating gram-negative infection because it just can't get inside. Now there's other challenge that we sometimes have to deal with. Just like we have porin structures that allow things to go in, bacteria often have uh, these efflux pumps and these come sometimes as a result of resistance. And these uh, exclude or rather efflux molecules, uh, drug molecules from the periplasmic space and into the outside environment. And the consequence of this is that you never really get high enough concentration of a drug that you're trying to use inside the periplasmic space. And because of these types of efflux pumps, we get resistance, drug resistance. And sometimes these pumps are multi-drug resistance. So they're able to export or efflux a wide range of drug molecules. And that may result in resistance to not just one antibiotic, but multiple antibiotics. Pseudomonas in particular is notorious uh, for developing these types of mechanisms, efflux pump mechanisms to exclude or reflux drugs and become resistant to a lot of the drugs that we try to use.